This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Reverend Dr. Charles E. Goodman, Jr. I am the senior pastor, teacher of the Tabernacle Baptist Church. So good to... Some of y'all may not know who I am, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Will you pray with me today? Lord, we bless you and we honor you. You alone are worthy to be praised. We are ecstatic and grateful because there is none like you. So, Lord, we pray now in this moment that you will speak to our hearts. We thank you for this opportunity to come, to bless you, to honor you. And, Lord, as we are once again engaging the word of God to grow and to share, especially when it comes to that incredible superhero called the Advocate. We pray that we're helped, that we can bring clarity, but also bring understanding for us as we try our best to engage what the Holy Spirit does for us every single day. So Lord, help us to not only receive, but also to once again live out what the Word is challenging us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. This is the day that the Lord has graced us and blessed us. We are excited to be in the house of God. I am grateful to be sharing with us in this series called The Advocate, but can we thank God for our incredible dream team um, that has done a phenomenal job. I am great, grateful and honored to have so many gifted uh, proclaimers of the gospel who really challenge and really spread one another on and they have done an incredible job of really undergirding and helping us in this series has it been a blessing has it helped us i hope it has it has been one specifically for me um, that has allowed me to grow in my own understanding of the holy spirit we understand how the spirit is supposed to drive us and the spirit is supposed to lead us and guide us but we've been hoping to give illumination so over the last few weeks we talked about the advocate as our helper how is it a consistent companion with us that goes with us and guides us in all that we do? We also lift up a wonderful attribute of the uh, Holy Spirit, the Advocate, as our teacher. How many of you know it instructs us in everything, tests us in everything, and empowers us in everything? And we understand that aspect because I ought to have some educators in here. We know the important role of teachers, and so that's what the Advocate provides for us as well. And then on last week, we talked about the Holy Spirit, the advocate, as our intercessor. I don't know about you. It is good to know when I don't have the words to even put into the right place. The Holy Spirit, the advocate, comes in in our weakness, when we're speechless, when we're clueless. And yes, even when we are hopeless, we know that the advocate shows up in moments like that. Today, I want to continue that foundational portion. We're going to continue to lift this up. Just as a reminder, whether you're in person or online, you want to keep all of your sermon notes. Our whole aim is at the end of the series, it's only a six-week series, that you'll be able to form your own advocate comic book with all the sermon outline. Amen? And so there's something that we can be able to share and be able to discuss that you can continue to go back. That's why I'm always encouraging people. That's why taking notes is an important part of worship. Why? Because it is important for us that when we go home, when it's our time to study and meditate, a good spiritual practice is that whatever you've heard during that week, go back, sit down, meditate on it, read over it, pray over it. That's the way that it can get once again embedded into our spirit. Today, I want to continue it a little further. We talked about the Holy Spirit, the advocate as our helper, as our teacher, as our, as our interceder. Today, I want to push you a little further, and today we're going to talk about the advocate as our provider. The advocate as our provider. Our foundational text is going to be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to be lifting up between verses 4 and 11. And as we've been sharing uh, throughout this time uh, here, I'm going to be in one of those treaching moments. We want to just make sure that we are getting clarity in the things that we're sharing. But today's text, the foundational portion, is going to really talk about how the advocate provides for us. Now, I must go ahead and lay down some claim. Now, this provision does not come as just the Holy Spirit pays your bills. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit puts food on your tables, which are incredible things, and we're grateful that God provides in those ways. But today I want to really push it further because I think that if you're to just limit it to just the tangible ways that we're giving that, may I also suggest that one of the great ways we can understand is that the Holy Spirit provides us, watch this, gifts, talents, and the callings that we have. That's an important portion because this whole concept of the advocate helps us to operate in the assignment and the places that God assigns us to be in. You will never be able to operate in your gift if you don't have the Holy Spirit. You'll never be able to know what your calling is without the Holy Spirit. You will never be able to operate in unity if you do not have the Holy Spirit. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm getting reading between verses 4 and 11 that I think should highlight for us uh, what this means about how the advocate 
provides. Hear the word of God for us on this day. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all the people. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To many there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and they gives them to each one just as he determines. As we think about it again today, I want to continue that dialogue as we've been having over the last few weeks. I want to talk about the advocate as our provider. Lord, speak, your people need to hear. One of the things that is crucial, and I hope that you're gleaning this, that we understand how the Spirit operates, and the Spirit being the part of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's been our aim over the last few weeks to make sure that we're being very intentional to show the different aspects, the different attributes for which the advocate, the Holy Spirit, provides for us. This is significant. And the reason why this is significant is because one cannot fully realize one's potential or possibilities if one does not understand how the Spirit operates in our lives. Jesus said in one of the workings that he declared, God is Spirit, which means that the Spirit has no limitations. It's unchanging, it's uncaused, and it's ungoverned. But one of the chief aims for many of us is we don't recognize that the Spirit is always available to us. That's one of the chief aims in bringing about this series is because I wanted to make sure, and those who are sharing in the burden of preaching and teaching, wanted to be very clear that the Spirit isn't just something that meets you at the church. But to really be honest and to really fulfill the true meaning of what the Spirit is in our lives and to have a Spirit-led and Spirit-full life, is to understand that the Spirit is always operating and it's always there. Reminds me of the story of an older preacher. Uh, she was given an assignment to go preach. And so she was going ahead to go preach, but she had lost her notes. If anybody's ever had to do anything as far as public speaking or preaching, you understand to lose one's notes can be so unnerving and frustrating. Look everywhere, all over the house, the kitchen table where she studied in her, in her desk, but she found no notes. And so you can imagine she was so concerned. She still had an assignment. That's where she had to go. So this is what she decided. Well, I've got to show up regardless, so let me go. And here's the reality, and I'm just hoping that something will come. Hopefully, the Spirit will show up. But when she got there, here was the reality. When she gets to the place where she had to speak, she pulls out her Bible, sets it on the lectern, and guess what? Right there in her Bible was a note she was looking for. The very thing that she was trying to find was already there. And for many of us, let me just go ahead and be real. I think that's one of the aims that I hope that this series has challenged us. God is not interested in hide and seek with you. God wants to be found. God is evident. God is present in our everyday lives. As we think about that, it also gives us the reality of where I want to kind of land in this whole idea of the advocate as provider. Because as the advocate as provider, it allows us to understand what exactly is provided to us. In the context of the text that we have today, we're going to focus uh, solely on this one passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, now it's important to note there were a lot of other aspects we could have lifted, but we want it for the sake of this. Because I think one of the most undervalued, underutilized moments of the power of the Holy Spirit is how the Holy Spirit equips us. How the Holy Spirit empowers us and how the Holy Spirit gives us what we need to fulfill the callings that God has for our lives. Now, when you put it in context, when you begin to think about the passage, 1 Corinthians, let's go ahead and put it out there. The Corinthian church, which was the largest church in Paul's day, but it was also the most dysfunctional church. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. There was a lot of issues that were happening in the Corinthian church. Matter of fact, when you read the first and second missive that was sent to Paul, sent by Paul to this Corinthian church, you can tell there was a lot of tension and frustration. They were probably tired of his leadership, and he was probably tired of their fellowship. It was just a lot of things that was happening. I'll be honest with you, as someone who loves the word of God, I would have loved to have seen their responding letters to Paul. We, we don't have how they reacted or they responded. We only know that he sent one and then he had to send another. <laughs> Anybody's ever had to talk to somebody to communicate, this, you know that second word is also. Now listen, I didn't try to tell you the first time. 
It's almost to get them back into right rhythm and let them know, hey, check this out. Now, in case you missed what I said the first time, let me give it to you the second time. But the first one is where he really begins to hone in. And I think it's one of the most powerful and yet descriptive moments that Paul lifts out to this dysfunctional, divisive community. And what made them divisive is that for some reason they were large, they didn't lack in resources, but they didn't understand how they were supposed to operate together. Because here's the challenge, and I think it is an important part of our walk and our contemporary living today, is that for many of us, we don't mind the vertical relationship that we have. It's, it's, we love this thing with God. But part of us challenge because you're not just called to live vertically, you're also called to live horizontally. When you look at the picture of the cross, notice that it points upward and outward. And most of us, especially today, we can talk to God, but we can't talk to one another. We love God, but then don't like other people. And our relationship with God is predicated on how we operate. And God graces us and blesses us to operate in ways that we're not just trying to honor God this way, but we also honor God horizontally. What does that mean? Well, let's go ahead to look into that because I think that when you look about it, at the end of the day, this is Paul's chief aim, is that we learn to work together as a good team. That's it. That at the end of the day, it takes teamwork to make the dream work. Now, listen, next week is going to be our sports uh, week, so you're supposed to wear your favorite sports team. Um, really, I try to tell y'all, wear the good sports team. If, <laughs> if, if, you need, if you need any idea about which team to wear, just send me a message. I'll respond to you, and I can give you a whole list of teams that you shouldn't wear, but that's neither here nor there. But anybody that's part of a team understands that how one operates together is imperative for victory. That on every team, you got star players, but you got role players. And role players are just as significant to the success of the team as a star player. One of the worst things that could happen, and many of you who have ever played on the team, is when a role player thinks they're a star player. At the end of the day, this is what Paul is trying to tell them. All y'all cannot be stars. There's only one star, Jesus Christ. Which means on the team of the kingdom, we got a role to play. And if you do not play your role, guess what? The team loses. This is why this is imperative. This is why it's building upon what the advocate provides for us, how the advocate is our helper, our teacher, our interceder. How the advocate provides is it gives us our roles. And you have to understand the role that the Holy Spirit gives us is important. Here's the truth. I need you to get this. And this might be a good point to jot down. The Spirit does not give us what we need to get to God. No. But the Spirit gives us what we need so that God can get in us. See, we have a lot of times we love to go to church. We love to say we're in the presence of God. But it's one thing for you to try to get to God, but it's another thing for God to get in you. And operating in the Spirit, the Spirit provides for us because it allows us to understand that when I'm in this thing called the kingdom and I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit, when it provides for me, at the end of the day, it's not what I'm providing God. It's what God provides for me. And anyway, when you look at this, Paul is basically saying that God is doing through us, that at the end of the day, he wants them to know God has a strategic plan. God is intentional. Someone say intentional. God is strategic. Someone say strategic. In other words, when God created you, there was intentionality and there was strategy in how God created you. None of us are accidents in the divine will and divine plan of God, which means that each one under the, uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit has been given to us what we need to align ourselves and fulfill what God has called us to fulfill. Now, with that being stated, at the end of the day, the question that is raised for us is how are you shining? What does your light, what does your life bear witness to? I thought about this not too long ago. Um, if you've ever been part of our main location, you know that in 2008, uh, we built our Family Life Center. A Family Life Center was built. We started construction in 2007. We completed it in 2008. And so there were certain things, ancillary things, that the construction management was trying to tell us to do that. I'm, okay, fine. You know, I was all about how many, how many rooms, how much square footage, what can we do, da, 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 da. And there was stuff that they were just running by me that I really didn't even think about. And one of the things that I did not think about, y'all, that was a huge thing was this thing called floodlights. Now, I know you don't think about it. I didn't think about it. I promise you, I hadn't considered floodlights in the last 15 or so years that we had our building. However, a few months ago, I had to go to the church uh, at night. I had to pick up something from my office that I left there. 
And when I drove up on the parking lot in the Family Life Center, I noticed that our building looked dark. It looked dark. I had never noticed it before. The reason the building looked dark, for some reason, there was electrical outage or whatever. Watch this. We, our floodlights had went down. Anybody know anything about floodlights? Their main job and role and responsibility is to illuminate something. That's their job. The light of the floodlight is never meant to shine on itself. It's meant to shine on something else to bring brilliance, to bring illumination to something else. The floodlights by themselves is not about bringing light to them. It's about bringing light to something else. But here's what's crazy. That day, watch this, the lights were out. And what should have been shining on the building, because they were out, the building was dark. And I wonder, as I began to think about that, here we had to do something about it. I said, I never want to have that happen again. So guess what we had to do? We had to install, watch this, solar paneled floodlights. This time, we weren't going to waste for outside power. We wanted the power of the sun to empower the floodlights to illuminate the family life center. You missed it. Because I learned a lesson there, and maybe that's the lesson for you and I today, is that when your power source is lacking, at the end of the day, we ought to have the power of the sun. I'm not talking about the S-U-N, but I'm talking about the S-O-N. It is the sun, Jesus Christ, that we ought to be shining towards. So when we think about that, let me share some things. Let me give you these, and I want you to jot these down. These are critical and important because it outlines for us how we should view the advocate as our provider. Number one, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, watch this, provides the gifts we have. The Holy Spirit, the advocate, provides the gifts we have. Now, it's critical to understand that term gift. I need you to get this. You don't earn a gift. <clears throat> you are given a gift. I need to make sure this is clear, especially when it comes to us understanding gifts from God. Because as many of us who oftentimes operate under what I call gift envy, and if you don't get the gift you like, you mad. Well, you can't complain over something you didn't earn. Neither can you complain over something you didn't ask for. <clears throat> when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's not the only exhaustive list of gifts, but it's one we'll lift up in this one. I, I would push each of you. I think one of the chief things that all of us should do is go through and have our spiritual gift inventory. That's important. Um, because you need to know what gifts one has. But let me lift up what um, first, first Corinthians chapter 12, there's a lift of gifts, and what are they lifted for? These gifts are used, watch this, for the edification and the upbuilding of the body. <clears throat> now I need to say this clear, because for some reason, we have inundated ourselves to assume that our gifts are meant to make us look good, to give us prestige, and to make us popular. That is not why the Spirit provides us gifts. <clears throat> Your gift is given to edify and build up the body. If your gift only serves you, it's not from God. <clears throat> it's crucial. So when we look at the lists, let me, let me share them with you. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it gives a list. Let me share them with you. This is what is given based upon what Paul was sharing to this Corinthian church. Number one, word of wisdom. The ability to offer practical and insightful guidance and advice based on divine wisdom. Words of wisdom. But there's another gift, words of knowledge. The capacity to have deep and supernatural knowledge and understanding of spiritual matters. In other words, what word of knowledge suggests to us is that certain things that you can't take credit for, the Holy Spirit, God has to let you know it. There's a story when Jesus is out and he asks the disciples a poignant question. He says, who do people say that I am? They say, look, man, people say that you're Jeremiah. They say you're Elias. They said all this. And then he said, all right, check this. Who do you say that I am? Peter, y'all know Peter. That's my main man. I love me some Peter. But he said, you are the Christ, son of God. Watch Jesus' response to Peter. He said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. In other words, he didn't want Peter to get the big head. He said, don't get it twisted. You would have never came to that revelation on your own. The Spirit, God the Father, had to give it to you. There's faith. Faith is a spiritual gift. 
An extraordinary level of faith that goes beyond normal belief and allows individuals to trust in God's power and guidance in exceptional ways. There's another gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the gift of healing. This is the ability to heal physical, emotional, or spiritual ailments through prayer or laying on of the hands. It's an actual gift. I can't wait till we move into the month of October. We're bringing back this year miracles at midnight. I can't wait to share. We're just going to come and pray and believe God for miracles and believe God to do things that only God can do. I know they may spook some people. I still believe in the supernatural. I believe that God can get, open up blinded eyes. I believe he can make the lame walk. I believe that every aspect of our spiritual reality can be realized and the Spirit is still operating. That, that is an actual gift that is given to you by the Spirit. Right? There's the working of miracles. Power to perform extraordinary and supernatural acts beyond the laws of nature. There's prophecy. Prophecy is a gift from the Spirit. The ability to receive and communicate messages from God. Often related to guidance, encouragement, or correction. There's discerning of spirits. The capacity to perceive and distinguish between different spiritual influences, including identifying false teachings and false prophets. That's why it's imperative that you have discernment. Try the spirit by the spirit. Everything that you encounter, you should not digest. Speaking in tongues. And I know, I know that gets the thing, especially when you look into the passage. But speaking in tongues is the ability to speak in languages unknown. It does not just mean speaking in gibberish. If you go back to Acts when they were speaking in tongues, it was unknown languages. We, we have no idea what language is they were exactly saying, but it was the tongues and languages that they were not used to accustomed to themselves. It's when they were given the utterance based upon the gift of the Spirit. And then the ninth gift listed is interpretation of tongues. The ability to interpret and explain the meanings of messages spoken in tongues for the benefit of the congregation. Watch this. Because even in their context and our context, tongues should be interpreted. Why? Because they are used for the upbuilding and the edification of the body. I'm going to have to spend a Bible study to explain all that to you. But I want you to understand these were the list of nine gifts that the text says is what the Spirit provided. And what he was really trying to say, that if your name your, it falls upon whatever gets here, don't get it twisted. You didn't choose. The Spirit chose you. And what gifts you have, watch this, you didn't determine. Read the text. The Spirit determined. He knew where you was going to be, what you was going to do, and he knew the skill set. He knew the gift set you needed to prosper how you were. When we think about that, that is important. Because it's important to note that the very interpretation of beliefs regarding spiritual gifts and their relevance is still important. Which is why you've got to be clear and sure about what gifts did the Spirit give me. Because if you're unsure, you will never be able to operate, watch this, in the place that you're supposed to operate. The Bible is clear. Your gift makes room for you. But it can't make room if I don't know what room I'm supposed to be in. I'm recently trying, um, having to try to update um, nutrition. So I'm trying to stop fast food. But every now and again, I've got on a good habit of going to smoothies place. Used to rock with Smoothie King. Now I rock with Tropical Smoothie. Love me some Tropical Smoothie, even though they kind of changed their menu up. So one day I went to Tropical Smoothie. I'm there in Tropical Smoothie. It's just me in Tropical Smoothie. Choose my little smoothie, add my little enhancements. You know, I want my energizer, fat burner, whey protein. You know, I got to add all that stuff in, multivitamin, all that stuff in. And so when it finished, um, guy asked for my name on my order. I look around like, okay. <laughs> I'm the only one up in here, but cool. Good man on the order. So I'm sitting back. I'm the only one in the restaurant. Y'all, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, these people start making smoothies. One after another and I'm looking at myself like I'm the only one up in this tropical smoothie I was getting frustrated they start making them and putting this little refrigerator on the side start making them put into the refrigerator on the side start, to the point I got frustrated I said excuse me um when are y'all gonna do mine 
And they say, sir, not trying to be funny, but we have to create and make those that are part of our Uber dash or a part of our, uh, our, our other ones. They, we have to get those out of line. I was, I was mad. I was, boy, I was frustrated because I'm thinking to myself, they can wait. They ain't even here. <laughs> they ain't here. The people ain't here. Make me my smoothie. Until finally, made me a smoothie. Lady called my name, Goodman. She goes around, she hands me the thing. And I ain't gonna mind, I ain't, I'm frustrated. And I'm going to walk out this door, and that's when the spirit catches me and say, you just missed the revelation. The revelation was, I was getting frustrated because I kept seeing stuff being made before mine. And I was getting frustrated because I didn't know whose it was. I didn't know who was coming to get it. So part of me was like, why have I got to keep waiting on something? Until finally, I realized that what I had ordered already had my name on. So one no need for me tripping, being frustrated. Why? If I just learn how to be patient, whatever has my name on it. Okay, y'all missed it. You like me. I get it. I feel you. That, that's sometimes the challenge, especially when it comes to the things of God. You just sitting there, and I'm here to tell you, whatever has your name over, whatever the Holy Spirit has endowed for you, whatever gifts he has, guess what? You ain't got to be in competition. You ain't got to get in line. Guess what? What is for you is going to be for you. It already got your name on it. So I don't have to sit back and go back and forth and have gift envy. I realize that I already have what the Spirit says I need to have. Holy Spirit provides the gifts that we have. But there's something else. The Holy Spirit, watch this, the advocate, watch this, provides the callings we receive. Now, I know it. This is where I need some little, I need some tension with you because um, there is a slight demarcation between your gifts and your callings. And the Spirit involves us in both of them. The Spirit moves, it operates in both of them. So, so as you're looking at it, this thing about the Christian spiritual gifts, callings are related concepts, but they have distinct meanings and implications. So how then is the process? How then can I discern what my gifts are and how they are supposed to grow out for my callings? This is important. First of all, it operates through guidance and revelation. That I want to suggest that oftentimes the way you are able to discern based upon what your callings are, based on what gifts you've been given, is through guidance and revelation. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit is believed to guide individuals by providing insight, promptings, and revelations about one's life's purpose and their calling. Now, how does this come? Because I get this all the time. I get this all the time. P Pastor, how am I supposed to know what I'm supposed to do? Right? This is the month we're trying to challenge people to get involved in ministry and all the kind of things. And I know my inbox is always in your data. Well, Pastor, how do I know what I'm supposed to do? And so we always do something that I think is kind of odd. We always go to people. What do you think I should do? And I always have a hard time answering that question. Why? Because I didn't create you. <laughs> Which means in order for me to know what I'm supposed to do, I got to go to the source. So what does that look like? Pray. When was the last time you prayed? God, okay. What am I supposed to be doing in this moment? Pray. Prayer is an important time to help you understand what your calling should be. Not just prayer, meditation. Meditation, sit, think, meditate, ponder. Take some time, right? Meditate. Or a deep sense of conviction. Because oftentimes what you're calling is, is what bothers you the most. If it's irritating you, that might be where God is calling you to be. If it frustrates you, man, I can't believe these young people. That maybe you're called to help with young people. Because a lot of times it's that deep conviction that moves in our lives. But it's not just guidance and, and revelation but also confirmation and affirmation. The Holy Spirit can affirm and confirm a person's calling through inner peace, sense of purpose, and confirmation from others in the Christian community. It provides a deep assurance that one is on the right path. My call in the ministry was kind of intriguing. I think I've known since I was about eight years old that there was something God wanted me to do, but I never knew exactly what it was. This became to be, to be affirmed in my life my senior year of college at Wake Forest University. My senior year, I decided to go back and help the Wake Forest Gospel Choir 
as a drummer. I grew up playing instruments, so drums, keyboards, organ, piano, all those things. I love playing instruments. So my senior year of college, I decided at least get back right, because my first couple of years in college, boy, y'all looking at me so judgmental. I, I, feel, I feel so embarrassed that y'all looking at me like this. But I know I ain't the only one that ever had. As soon as I went to school, I was like, Lord, thank you for giving me that. <laughs> but senior year came around, I wanted to live, live life. So, so I came back and decided to play drums. And this is interesting. So our gospel choir, my senior year goes on a, a college tour or a, a spring tour. But what's interesting was during our spring break, but we didn't do any churches. We only did one church, but we did like women's shelters, homeless shelters, and different places where we went to minister. I never forget, it's about the second or third, it may have been the second or third day, we're at, in Miami, Florida, in a homeless shelter. Room is jam-packed. Our set was about 45 minutes to an hour, and so we're singing, that was it. We were just coming there to sing. We're down on our last song, man, and the Holy Spirit fell in a phenomenal way. I'm playing drums. I'm on the drums. Next thing I know, I'm in front of the crowd with a microphone exhorting people. I have no idea what I said. But that night, 75 people come down to give their life to Christ. When I get back on the bus afterwards, everybody don't even want to look at me. they like, who is this guy? Because I never had experienced that before. I can't tell you what took me from the drums to the front, but it was a night of confirmation for me. It was almost as if God had shown me in that moment, this is what you are called to do. From that moment forward, it has been a con continued trajectory it has been continued velocity. I'm still standing in front of people trying my best to compel them to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what happens. So even though my gifts may be faith, prophecy, and those things, my calling is manifested as a pastor. And that's why it's important that you understand the difference between your gifts and calling. Why? Because just because you got a skill set or a gift set doesn't mean that you're called to a certain particular calling. I was telling him on the way here, I said, listen, just because you jump high don't mean you should play basketball. That's a talent, but maybe you're called to do long jump. You got to be careful to make sure that I am materializing my gifts into my calling. And whatever God calls you to, watch this, he's going to give you what you need to fulfill the assignment. Grandfather was going to, to the toy store, pick up a, a new toy for his grandson. He goes there, he has sales to you, they find one of the nicest new race car toys. So we're getting ready to buy it. So he's walking up to the, to the cash register, to the counter, puts it on there, and then right when he's getting ready to, to, to pay it off, he said, oh man, my bad. And he runs off from the sales associate. He leaves the toy race car there, and then he goes back. Then he rushes back out of breath, and he puts down a pack on the uh, conveyor belt. Sales so associate said, what, what's the promise? To, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to get home and not have what I needed for the car to run, I went back and got some batteries. That's what a sales associate said. Why'd you do that? He was like, well, I want to make sure that this race car works. She said, excuse me, sir, but obviously you didn't read the label. She turns over the label of the race car, and big ass day on the race car, this is what it said, batteries, y'all missed it. See, here's the problem, is that oftentimes you assume you got to go find some other help. You got to find some other source. Let me tell you something. When God calls you to something, he gives you every need, everything you need to fulfill what he's calling you to do. Let me tell you something. Spirit is already included. Power is already included. Listen, the Holy Spirit provides the gifts we have, the callings we receive. And here's the third and final thing. The Holy Spirit, the advocate, provides the unity we experience. I'm done when I tell you this. The Holy Spirit, and this is why it's important. This is why the Spirit and the advocate does some of his greatest works because not just about gifting and callings, but how the spirit is meant to put us all together. It plays a vital role in the unifying believers in the community, such as the congregation and gathering. At the end of the day, this is what it does. It unifies us around certain things that we ought to be able to have no argument over. There's no argument over our common faith. Spirit is seen, the one who draws individuals to faith in Jesus Christ. I can't tell you how many times I get in all these conversations. People want to argue about this and argue about this. And I tell them the core of the Christian faith is based upon one non-negotiable truth. Jesus died, was buried, and three days later rose again from the dead, ascended to the high, is on the right hand of the Father. At the end of the day, we can argue about everything else if you want to. 
There's one non-negotiable thing we believe as our faith that we have to be unshaken for. Our common faith is based upon our belief in Jesus Christ. But then also our spiritual gifts and understand how significant and important they are. They are meant for the common good of everybody. Fostering independence and cooperation amongst members. Also, we're unified around prayer and worship. Don't get it twisted. Yeah, you can pray by yourself. And yeah, you can worship all by yourself, but ain't nothing like being around other people. Ain't nothing about being amongst brothers and sisters. That's why the Bible says don't forsake the assembling of yourself. Why? Because in the community, we are strengthened when we learn to worship and pray with one another. And our common mission. Common mission. The Spirit embowels us to tell, once again, to share the gospel, serve the needy, promote justice, understand this is important. And also we're surrounded and unified by intercession and empowerment. I said this, they said this on last week. It's good to know when I don't know what to say. The Holy Spirit knows what to say. It provides us everything that we need. And there's one last thing that is empowerful, empowering for us, the gift of love. I can't overstate this. You need the Holy Spirit to help you love one another. But the way the Holy Spirit also helps us, first of all, is it helps you love yourself. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Part of the dysfunction that we have is hard to love others when you don't love yourself. Which means you need the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit helps you to understand that people are going to be people, but I'm going to love them like God loves me. That's why one of the powerful things is when you say, Lord, take my natural and put your super on it and help me be who you want me to be. You will never be able to be unified if you don't see who you really are. This past week, I had the opportunity to preach for one of my mentors at his first anniversary at Second Baptist Church, Dr. Maurice Watson. And after church, he took me to a sister's house, and they cooked us a good old country, country meal. I was in Little Rock, Arkansas, so they had all the good fixings that you would want in the country. All the stuff I couldn't eat at all. I mean, they had neck bones, and they had oxtail. I mean, whoo. It looked good, but I was like, mm, can't do it. But I did enjoy the macaroni and cheese, the cabbage, the beans, and they had a great pecan pie. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So after we ate, here's the crazy thing. So preachers are there. So some of my friends, my best friend in the world for the porner came through. I met Bishop Stephen Arnold was there. And so there was people there. And there's nothing like preachers around food and fellowship. Like we are good time and we love talking and telling stories. Well, one of Dr. Watson's members, who's not a preacher, but he's a real funny guy by the name of Bill Walker. He was there. And so Bill Walker is one of those guys. He's not a preacher, but he tells you how to preach. <laughs> you know people like that? I know. They can tell you how to do what you do better than you can do it yourself. So that was what happened. So Bill Walker's there, and he, so we're telling our stories. We're having a good time. And Bill Walker, he's a story that I think is so powerful. He talks about the time that him and a couple of people went to visit Haiti. Haiti is going through, you know, one of our, our brothers and sisters over there in the motherland, and you know they're having a lot of challenges. And so we talked about how they went on a mission trip to Haiti. And so they just got out of a major conflict. So these dignitaries were coming to engage in some of the communities. So they had, a lot of these were orphan kids who were now stuck they didn't have parents, and so they were putting them all in this one big room to try to educate them. So he said how he talked about all these dignitaries rolled up in these nice, shiny, black BMWs, and they were just rolling up to try to help the people uh, in, this, in this area. And so he said that what happened, the kids came running out, and they started jumping around the cars. And so they were just jumping around, just acting crazy, so excited around the car. So Bill said he was in the car talking to other people, said, I wonder if they know uh, who we are. Because he was assuming that, they, that they, were, they were jumping around because of them in the car. So the teachers start telling the kids, go back, go back, go back to your room. So when they roll the window down, say, man, were they that excited to see us? I mean, do they know who we are? And the teacher said, um, they didn't know y'all was in the car. What made these students excited was that they could see themselves in the reflection off the car. For most of these kids, they have never seen what they look like. And so now that they finally saw themselves, they couldn't help but be excited. I wish I had time. Because when you have the spirit, when you are sure about who you are and how God has gifted you and what God has called you to and how you operate in the king work, that's why you get excited. That's why people shouldn't have to pump or prod you. Why? Because when you know who you are, when the spirit has empowered you, then you have no problem. Let's stand. I, I want to let you know.
that the Spirit provides. Everyone in here, even online, you have your own unique spiritual DNA. But we can never be our full self if you don't embrace your gifts, fulfill your callings, and be committed to unity. It's almost like putting, I don't know about you, it's almost like putting a puzzle together and having a piece missing. Ain't nothing more frustrating than that. Because no matter how much you put in place, if it ain't all there, something's just not right. That's why I need you to understand the Holy Spirit helps us, teaches us, intercedes in our lives and intercedes for us. But it also, watch this, it provides for us. And so I want to give you homework because I think at the end of the day, I need to know, God, who have you made me to be? Spirit, make it clear. I am important. I do have gifts. I do have a calling. And I'm called to unify it. To our Tab Global family, we're going to pray for you because I believe that for all of us, that's an important aspect. And you will never be able to find that out if you do not have help from the advocate. God, we pray for our Tab Global family and those who've tuned in, whether now, live, or even on demand. We pray, God, that you once again show up in their lives. Lord, we admit and acknowledge that sometimes we can become self-centered and self-focused on the very thing that you have not called us to be focused on. So, Lord, help us to know what you've gifted us with, what you've called us to, and what work we're meant to be and to do. So, Lord, I pray now in this moment that you would once again continue to push us, stretch us to fulfill all that you have for us to fulfill. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. To our Tab Global family, we love you, we thank, and we're praying, God, for you. You see the multiple ways on the screen um, that you can connect, be a part of this church. The heart of this church is open, even in the digital space. We're looking forward to continue committed relationship. And listen, the advocate is always working. Excited, because we've got a few more weeks to go. But just know, advocate is providing for you. We say this all the time, because we've been blessed, we're going to be a blessing. Come on, Tab in person. Let's say bye-bye to our Tab Global family.